there. Um, but questions. So can I invite my speakers, please, to turn their cameras back on? And we've got some questions in the Q&A already. And I know that um, my colleague Jane, who's in the wings, has got a question as well. But let's just go straight to, I'm just going to go straight to the first one that came in, which was a question for Julie, um, which was, does Digital Voice for Communities have all the equipment how much and what are the maintenance costs? Straight into the nitty gritty. Yeah. Um, so we do. So we, we don't expect the groups or the museums that we work with to have all of the digital equipment. Um, but it's um, quite simple stuff that we use. We use iPads for all of the filming because it's really accessible um, and you can film and edit on there using different apps. So um, the camera's on there and then you get an ad editing app like iMovie. Um, or cap cut, something simple like that, um, which even have music in. iMovie's got music, so you don't have to pay for copyrighted music, which, which can be expensive. Um, and then we'd have a, a boom mic. Again, you can get one for an iPad, an iRig mic, for example, other mics are available. Uh, a boom pole is about 40 quid for just a simple non, you know, bog, bog standard boom pole, which is what you put your microphone on. Um, so that can uh, film people standing away from them. A, a tripod, you'd need a tripod adapter for the iPad, which is which extends, put over your iPad and then it, you can attach it to the tripod. Um, so there are a few considerations for, for doing that, but um, an iPad is about uh, £320 at the moment for your basic iPad. You need to think about storage issues on there, so get one with about 30 or even six, 32 or 64. Um, Gig storage. Um, what else? Yeah, and then when we're uh, working with people, a projector and uh, screens. We have a portable screen, uh, MiFi with on a contract, so that we've got internet wherever we go. Um, but obviously, out out in the field, when you're filming with your group, you don't need need that stuff. But when you're editing, then you would, especially if people have got access issues, they can see things on a big screen. Um, so often with groups, um, if people have additional needs, learning disabilities, we'll edit in turn. So we won't set them away editing straight away on their own or in pairs. We'll edit as a group, make decisions as a group um, and edit like that. So a lot of training involved. Um, but like I said, you, you can learn to do that and then pass, pass that learning on to people. Thank you so much. And um, that working in partnership, I think a key thing to come through there, your model of working in partnership with heritage organisations is a great way into this. And I know that the you end up, you're not only skilling up the people in the groups you work with, you're skilling up the staff in the heritage organisations at the same time, aren't you? So that's a good way exactly. like this yeah. for you buy your own equipment, potentially. That's it. Like I, I would encourage you to buy your own equipment and, and do this yourselves. If you can learn first how to do it, um, then why not do that with your groups? It's, and the photography element as well. We do all that on iPads too. There's loads of different apps you can use to engage people. Yeah. And we can share in our follow up, we can share some um, links to some online resources that um, cover some of what Julie's been talking about as well. Thank you very much, Julie. Right, um, Kelly, question for Kelly. You've got a lovely juicy question here. So um, I'll just read it. It says, I'm fully in support of open access. How do you think museums and archives can pursue this amid other pressures from boards and funders to be more enterprise driven and use digital collections for commercial income, e.g. reproduction services and rights? And are you aware of organisations who've struck this balance? And a little additional one, but you might want to, to park this one, come to it next, is Triple IF the best option? Because I think once we get to that, we, need, we know I need to explain what Triple IF is as well. So let's go with the questions in one. <laughs> So I'll try to do my best. So the pressures of uh, it was very uh, delicately put, be more enterprise driven. And so that is expecting to make a profit from, or income, I should say, from your collections, from the uh, digital uh, 
uh, assets created from your collections. I think it's important to uh, remind ourselves as, as we're coming towards the end of the pandemic um, that we all have a little camera in our pocket um, and that um, uh, the, the camera or the computer in our pocket serves as both a way of uh, accessing collections and people have an expectation that the collections will be there, will be accessible on demand on our phone, but also they are uh, our own little kind of digitization machine. So there just isn't the um, uh, exclusivity of images as there perhaps was in the past. So I think oftentimes trustees, and it's important to remember that trustees have the, um, um, the sustainability of the organization uh, at, uh, as their focus, hopefully. Oftentimes trustees have an expectation that they're gonna make some income, and in some cases, vast amounts of income from uh, licensing and from selling licenses to the images. Um, more often than not, that is um, not true. I think most museums and archives do not make a significant or even an insignificant oftentimes amount of income from licensing their images. Um, and I think the more examples you can give uh, in making this argument to trustees, making the argument that to have open access to your collections, to support the mission of the organisation um, and the um, uh, the access to knowledge is more important than the uh, marginal profit um, in the enterprise driven I think is an important one. Uh, the second part of that question was asking about are there organisations in the UK that are doing that or that have made that um, argument successfully. Um, I want to mention a few. A, I have dropped, just dropped into the chat a um, survey of open glam organizations in Europe. Open glam means um, galleries, libraries, archives and museums that have um, an open access policy and that are generally speaking um, releasing the digitized versions both or in some cases of their um, uh, uh, images of their collections, in some cases of the metadata associated with, with their collections and in some cases both of those things on an open license. This is a survey that was done by Andrea Wallace and um, uh, I think it's Douglas McCarthy. Andrea, who I mentioned in my talk, is a lecturer in um, uh, digital rights in GLAM organisations and Douglas McCarthy works at Europeana, which is a, a EU funded um, digital aggregator. Um, but that is a really interesting survey to look through and you can actually do a, um, it's on Google Sheets and you can actually do a um, filter to find the English, or not the English, the, the UK organisations. I'll just give you a, a taster. Um, so Aberdeen Archives, Art Galleries and Museums, um, they are releasing their objects. Um, on a CC0, which means that if something is out of copyright, meaning that the creator of that artwork, for example, uh, died more than 70 years ago, they're releasing that on a CC0 license. So they will not be exerting any uh, copyright um, expectations over those objects. Uh, Bath Postal Museum uh, releasing things in a public domain. Uh, mark, which is like CC's, CC0. The British Library is an interesting case in point. The British Library acknowledges where some of their um, digitised uh, material is out of copyright, but because they're the British Library, they do things by the book. The UK, since leaving the EU, uh, it has complicated copyright law somewhere in the UK. So that means that the British Library acknowledges that even though something is in the public domain outside of the UK, in the UK, it may still be under copyright. So the collection at the British Library is more open outside the UK than it is in the UK. And so I think there are, well, let me do some maths. Um, there are, Oh, around 
60, if my maths are correct, examples of galleries, libraries and museums that um, have open access uh, policies. And it might be quite useful for you to look through those, see which are similar. See, I mean, um, Matthew gave us a great example of the information that heritage organisations give about themselves on their websites, you know, to compare what their websites are like. And then for the third part of that question, um, the use of IFF, uh, which I always forget what that's called. I think it's, um, oh God, International Image Interoperability Framework, uh, which is a, uh, a metadata framework, a machine readable, um, interoperable metadata framework that make, should make it easier for organisations um, uh, to um, share and to create tools that work across different organisations. Uh, the short answer to that question is yes. The long answer to the question is um, um, the, uh, oh, what are they called now, TANK. What does, what does TANK stand for? Towards, towards, towards collection. a National Collection. Too many acronyms. Yeah, Towards uh, a National Collection. <laughs> Uh, which is a, um, a publicly funded initiative that is aiming to get uh, heritage organisations to build capacity both within their collections um, around heritage organisations. Uh, if you are a um, uh, if you are associated with a regional museum, you should be able to get access to the advice that Tank is creating about using IFF. Um, in my opinion, there is inadequate support for more independent heritage organisations in getting involved in communities like uh, IIIF, and it is a community that operates it. And then finally, so that was a very long question. And then finally, I want to riff off of the work that Matthew outlined in his presentation, uh, which I said in the chat, I'm very pleased that you are adding things to Wikidata. That is fantastic. Um, and for me, that it was a, a prompt for me to remind the participants um, that when thinking about um, uh, making, uh, thinking about justice and liberation uh, uh, in how we think about the digital, um, uh, I use the word assets, but that seems like a very exploitative word, the digital um, representations about our collections, the metadata, in addition to any digital images is also very important to think about. The, both the metadata about the collections and in the case, uh, the project that Matthew described, the metadata about the organisations as well. And getting involved with the platform with a platform like Wikidata, which is a bit like Wikipedia, uh, except it's machine readable data, it's multilingual, um, it offers um, uh, multi, uh, vocality as well, it can give multiple uh, senses of authority as well, is a very um, interesting and arguably um, is probably the uh, kind of next um, uh, phase for GLAM organisations to get involved with in how they think about how they're represented um, in the data sphere. Sorry for the long answer. Don't apologise, that was a brilliant long answer. It was a long question and thank you very much, um, especially with your, your bad throat. That was, yeah, great Kelly. And uh, Jane and Alec have put some links in the chat um, about IIIF and the Tools and National Collection as well. I just wanted to um, ask Julie and Matthew just whether you have any, at, at the crux of that question, that tension between being enterprise driven versus being inclusive because of course it shouldn't be like that but that can be something that, that that's one of the old chestnuts that we come up against a lot isn't it and I just wondered if um or Julie if I come to you first if in the work that you do you sort of come up against that from leadership perhaps and, you know needing to make the argument for the inclusive inclusion side um I think the only examples that I can have is that the museums that we've worked with have been absolutely fantastic at sharing archive with us without charging for it. Um, there has been one local authority that has put a charge on archive images um, 
and even the archive images that we found had been donated to them by the heritage um, the history society we were working with so it was okay because we had access to that collection but i'd found one on their website and said oh can we have that and they were like well it's going to be 30 pounds please for that image which we just didn't hadn't um got funding for so you know we could build that in now to funding bids and i, I completely understand that um libraries etc have got to find funding from somewhere with all of the budget cuts but i think that's the only um only time that it's become an issue for us well that's good to hear any thoughts matthew um i can't think of anything off the top of my head i mean we're we're often um working with organizations to create audio descriptive guides and um and which invariably um you know they don't have to make them free but normally they will do because uh, organizations will not charge for an audio described guide because it it actually forms the only um the main way that they're fulfilling their um duty under the equality act of making the co collections accessible um so invariably um they kind of won't won't charge for that so we don't get much pushback from that um it reminds me though when i worked at the british museum and i was on the on the digital team at the british museum at the time that the um british museum published the um history of the world in 100 objects and they had the, the radio programs and they were desperately getting the book ready to publish the book which was the main way of making any income from that project because it was on radio and stuff um and I said that they needed to make the transcripts of the radio programs accessible um, online because um, because otherwise the project wasn't accessible to deaf people. And this was before the book came out. And they were going, but what happens if someone downloaded all the transcripts, put it together and then published the book before we even got it out? Um, and, you know, there was that worry, but they no one no one did. It, it, it's people underestimate the the you know the desire people want to have a book published by you know so anyway it, it didn't happen but there is that there is that constant fear um of in terms of of accessibility of, of the oh you well you might give away the asset um and stop people buying you know purchasing it but it invariably um doesn't happen yeah thank you kelly um yeah again riffing off of both what Julie and Matthew outlined um, and a potential um, uh, activist activity for us, especially those of us who may also be volunteering with other organisations, as oftentimes people who work in the glam sector do. Um, um, in the case of a, uh, uh, a, a regional records office, as Julia outlined, especially uh, one that gets public public funding, whether that be through our council taxes or whether that be through lottery funding. Um, it's important to remind them that oftentimes it's our council taxes that are paying to upkeep the records. Um, it's important to remind them also of their um, legislative responsibility for doing impact assessments on how access to that material would impact these communities um, that we're talking about, whether they be the disabled community or a marginalised community. Um, and also sometimes it's important to remind them of the requirements of lottery funding, of course, the National Lottery Heritage Fund, as I think the HLF is called now, requires that material be available under an open license. Um, there is some room for negotiation if there are ethical issues about needing a more restrictive license. You can speak about that with your um, uh, with your grant officer. Um, but I think it's also our responsibility to challenge when I say our our individual as well as our organisational responsibility to challenge institutions that may have these attitudes about a, a more uh, proprietary um, view of open licensing. Thank you so much, Kelly. Right, um, I'm going to just jump. We've got a couple of practical questions about uh, your project, Matthew, but I'm going to jump because I think this one leads on nicely uh, from it. So Helen, um, has asked, do you agree that it might be better to ask people for their requirements rather than list things we think they might need? 
and in a sense that talks to all three you know all three of your talks but Matthew let's start with you um in in relation uh, in relation to access information about a venue um I'm going to say no because um, I've seen museums do this where um um where a museum said you know I was talking to the museum about their access information and they said well what we do is is say to people get in touch with us and um tell us what you need and then we'll tell you the access information so what you're doing is essentially you're splitting your audience in two you're saying well you lot can just come you can turn up whenever you like but you lot have to talk to us beforehand you have to disclose your potentially your disability or access needs and tell us and then we give you the answer so it, it, it's basically um dividing people in two which which is which you know is not a great idea the, the, um so i'm going to kind of stick by what i um what i said which is you need to make everything you have available describing access barriers describing the the um the, what you've done to to um get around them or to remove those barriers and then let let people come and make their own mind up rather than make them you know go through a hoop of speaking to a particular person at a particular time who may not be there um they may decide to go spontaneously so they want to kind of look on the website now you know so I, I'm afraid um I'm going to say no it doesn't work great well that you, you might well have put the lid on that question then unless <laughs> Julie or Kelly had anything to add to that um just to reiterate what I said earlier, that when we start working with a group, particularly a group with um, additional needs, so learning disabilities, it could be learning disabilities, people with autism and physical disabilities in that group, is start to work with them beforehand where they already meet. So we work in partnership with local authorities, community groups. We meet the people, we work with them over a series of weeks and find out what their support needs are then. And then we negotiate yeah. with the museum. So these are the support needs of the group. How are you going to... Um, accommodate those and and it's worked really well like that and i would i would absolutely second that so um you know for example if you're having a virtual meeting you should ask everyone to say you know tell us if you have any access requirements that's that's for a specific and and you know in a, a, a group um like julie's working with absolutely yes you do it that way around rather than um you know but but this i'm talking about millions of people potentially around the country who may want to visit um so they should be able to just read the information like anyone else. Thank you. Now we're coming, we're into our last five minutes, but I want to go to this question about your virtual circle. So that virtual circle that you shared, Matthew, um, yeah. sparked real interest. And this question is um, that the key part of your virtual circle seems to be inclusive recruitment. Do you have examples of places that do this well or tips for things organisations can do to be better than this? So I'm going to come to you first briefly, but then also come to Kelly and Julie, if you can be thinking about tips around inclusive recruitment. Um, yeah. Funnily enough, I was going to have a bit more about that in my talk, but I wasn't sure how digital it was. But some of the, and so, so I removed it. Um, but I'm just going to check something. Um, uh, a few months ago, I um, tweeted something about how we'd changed um, our practice to to send all uh, interview uh, interviewees the questions two days before uh, their interview and this led to much more um much better interviews everyone gave a better uh, account of themselves and people felt um better about the interview they'd given their best chance and we we got better candidates um as a result um and it how and this had come out of um, supporting um, a neurodivergent uh, applicant who, who, who told us they were extremely nervous about, about interviewing. And so we sent the um, questions in advance. Um, I tweeted about this and I think I had something like 400 retweets, um, 300, 200 replies. And it just went. So I'm just checking. I did have that pinned um, on my profile. And I would just say my answer is read, read that thread. Um, but I don't, I, oh, thank you, Alex. Brilliant. Thank you, Alex. Um, the other thing I'd say is we are, I'm in the process of, of writing up our, um, recruitment policy, which, and we'll put it on our website. So, and I've got a board meeting tonight where the, where the board are looking at it. And so I can't share it until after that, but I will, 
Um, if that gets approved at today's board meeting, I will send it to Anna and she can share it, that link round. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm afraid it's 11.28, we're nearly out of time. Any, any very, very quick tips, Kelly? Um, yeah, so on recruitment, um, I think it's important to think about who the burden of equity, diversity and inclusion falls on. Um, are you expecting it to fall on the person who is from who is marginalised? Um, oftentimes when we're thinking about uh, being inclusive, what are we asking people to be included in? Because oftentimes the organisational structures and, and uh, culture we're asking them to be included in is a harmful and sometimes hostile organisational culture. Um, so I, uh, even though it is important, uh, to reduce as many barriers as possible in the recruitment process and processes. And I think Matthew gave us a great example is also the, of paramount importance that we apply these approaches throughout the systems in all aspects of the organization. And then um, finally, um, uh, and this is addressed as a previous question as well. Um, and as well as the point that Matthew raised, um, having a needs assessment uh, opportunity, not only for um, um, experts or community experts that you may be working with, or potential uh, uh, candidates, recruitment candidates, or members of staff, you know, having a process through which people can talk about their specific needs is very important. Thank you so much. Julie, we've run out of time. I'm sorry to come to you on that one. And Matthew, there's a couple of questions just before we close off about um, how heritage organisations were chosen for Vocalise to review and what sorts of resources. So perhaps sharing, I know there's a lot of information on your website, perhaps if you could just pop the link in the chat um, to your that page on your site. That would be great. So I'm very sorry, we ran out of time to go into detail on that last one from you, Lauren. Um, we need to, I need to let you all go. So I'm going to close just before thanking our speakers finally, by saying that this was the fourth seminar in the series of six, which was, um, is part of the Digital Skills for Heritage programme, which is a National Lottery Heritage Fund initiative. So we're very grateful for their support in this. The next one is on Monday, 25th of July, um, and it's at four o'clock to 5.30, and it's about digital enterprise and heritage. So how are digital behaviors and technology changing business models and heritage, and what does this mean for your leadership? So you can book onto that now, and if one of my colleagues could pop the link in the chat, Matthew's gonna share the answers with us um, to those questions from Lauren in our follow-up, which we'll share. So it just need to just, end by saying thank you so much, Julie, Kelly and Matthew, um, for your fascinating talks, for sharing your expertise with us and for your energy and time today. And thanks everybody for coming and we'll see you all at the next one at the end of July. Thanks everyone. Bye everybody. Oh, I've got some nice thank yous in the chat coming through. Three, so.